So my background is medicine, and I also have a, a PhD in information system. I'm heavily involved in uh, health information standards uh, development, uh, both in New Zealand and globally. So uh, I'll talk about models and set the context, um, because the, the, the way we understand models is quite different from what you guys uh, speak about models. And uh, I'll talk specifically about clinical information modeling. Uh, we'll look at some interoperability standards stack whereby there are some methods uh, which might be quite uh, relevant to you in terms of uh, uh, semantics. And I will show you some uh, concrete examples and, and, and kind of some mainstay uh, standards uh, and hopefully some discussion in the end. So what's a model? Uh, taking it to the very lower level, really, I just looked it up yesterday on the, uh, uh, the, the dictionary. And most of it is really irrelevant to our uh, cause. Um, uh, it's definitely not an RC uh, model or a uh, gorgeous model. But rather, uh, I try to highlight the ones that it might apply, uh, like an example of imitation or emulation, kind of. And archetypes definitely keep this term in your mind, because this is what we call our health information models as archetypes of clinical information. And probably the latter one fits uh, to the definition of the kind of models you guys are uh, dealing with. Uh, so talking about models, uh, the models that I'll be talking about in the medical informatics and EHR context is mainly around information models. And these are the main standards of EHR, Health Level 7, uh, the US-based uh, standards organization, ISO. Uh, a new initiative called Clinical uh, Information Modeling Initiative, and uh, the Object Management Group also has a uh, new uh, set of standards for clinical information modeling. We also have other sorts of, indeed, lots of different sorts of modeling we can possibly explore today. Uh, um, yeah, so our models are uh, models of the information that we want to capture from healthcare delivery. Our models are not models of real things or uh, entities or processes. It's about information. So here is what clinical information models uh, look like. Uh, they are known by different names, archetypes, again, uh, detailed clinical models. This is more of a political thing than a uh, uh, convenience. Uh, some group that was working uh, and didn't like the other group 
wants to prepare their own name. Uh, that's the story. Um, in these days, there are people. Most people are calling them clinical models as well. So the important thing is these clinical information models or archetypes basically the, define how clinical information is organized, structured, uh, and, uh, and and kind of um, and also the formal semantics uh, inside an uh, EHR system, a clinical data repository, or during health information exchange. So remember, this is all about defining the structure and the semantics of health information for uh, various purposes. So these models uh, basically facilitate uh, mainly the, the, the communication between the clinical and the technical people, so system developers and, 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 and clinicians, uh, because usually in software engineering, by developing software information systems, understanding <laughs> clinical concept is can be quite uh, challenging for technical people and vice versa. So um, th these models separate the technical and clinical roles very nicely. Uh, we use these models directly during uh, uh, software development to organize, to store, to query, and to display data. Uh, we can use these models as uh, as uh, kind of um, 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 like three directives for uh, three, three uh, applications uh, displaying clinical forms. These models also uh, form uh, like kind of mapping or transformation documents uh, during clinical data exchange uh, between different systems. And when we collect different data uh, from disparate systems and we try to link, for example, GP data with uh, you know, pharmacy data and with hospital data, uh, we usually use these models to be able to link the data safely so that we get the semantics right. And I must emphasize again that the whole point of clinical information modeling in medical informatics is support healthcare delivery. It's not really mainly for research or integrating biomedicine. So I'm really looking ways to exploit this in order to uh, you know support uh, research. Thank you. Um, so. This is probably uh, a bit of duplication. Uh, we we, we both use the formal uh, models of clinical information, mainly because clinical uh, software development is really very complicated. And uh, the, the idea is if we have reusable uh, uh, formal uh, models uh, to build clinical software to represent the business objects and the processes, at least we can reduce the, the time for and the cost for development, and uh, and uh, and also reduce the uh, the silo uh, silo nature of uh, clinical data collection uh, because most clinical applications, unfortunately, uh, reality uh, today is they don't follow any uh, uh, health information standards and. Uh, we really want to leverage the benefits of model-driven engineering and model-driven architecture in building and in maintaining and in exchanging uh, clinical data. Um, that's, that's the main purpose of uh, clinical information modeling. And for our purposes, uh, I think using these formal models which define the structure and the semantics of clinical information uh, in a really scientific or rigorous way is key to be able to link our, uh, uh, you know, our computational models with, with the uh, EHR data. Because uh, electronic health records, uh, the data uh, in EHRs are known to be uh, not so clean. Uh, uh, you know, there are lots of inconsistencies and uh, missing values and stuff. Um, yeah, so I hope you get the idea. So for me, the best way to understand what this thing is all about is to see some concrete examples. Uh, this is a blood pressure measurement uh, model uh, expressed as a mind map. This is a clinical information model. As you can see, uh, this uh, defines the data uh, which has some, uh, which has some um, data items which you might expect to see in a blood pressure measurement uh, kind of definition. But the important thing here that I want to highlight is that it actually encapsulates other very important stuff around protocol and kind of state, the state of the patient, and also whether this is like a point in time measurement or it's um, like 24 hour uh, you know, average, uh, etc. 
So these clinical information models, uh, the best practice is that we try to model these uh, in, in the smallest kind of non-divisible units of clinical uh, um, kind of expressions that are used uh, between, uh, you know, uh, during communication between real clinicians. So, for example, if you are getting a blood pressure measurement from a data set without knowing whether that measurement was taken while the patient was sitting or standing up, or the cuff size, uh, whether it was a pediatric size or a large cuff size, uh, you wouldn't uh, compute on it. You cannot possibly compute on it. So, having these self-defined, all encapsulated forms uh, uh, really help us um, make the data computable and uh, linkable. This is another example. Uh, it is the definition of how you represent a clinical problem uh, which can be a diagnosis in most cases. So as you can see, uh, there are lots of related things. In most, uh, for the most part, this is uh, in the data, uh, not much into the protocol, but uh, uh, the main point is if uh, um, health information system renders are producing systems that are making use of these models uh, underpinning their data models or their uh, uh, transformation, then we can have semantic interoperability uh, uh, between these uh, systems. This is a real example that I have been talking to a few of you. Uh, this is like a, a, a larger uh, model uh, which is uh, an aggregate model, which incorporates uh, a smaller model. So all the bold um, had, um, um, elements, uh, items here, are individual clinical information models that are brought together for the purpose of uh, capturing a cardiac registry uh, for the CATA, PCI CATA uh, uh, in, in New Zealand, uh, which is a national system which, is, uh, which has been deployed uh, and which is live at the moment. Um, so, using these kind of tools and, and, and making our data uh, uh, compatible uh, with these models makes our data interoperable and uh, help us to link with some other uh, kind of uh, data sources. So, where do these clinical information models fit into the in the picture, in, in, in your picture, uh, or in our picture. Um, uh, the way I see things is that um, biophysical models are really um, you know, best effort approximation of some uh, you know, biophysical phenomena. Uh, they can be entities or processes. I may be grossly uh, you know, uh, wrong, but that's how I see things. Um, um, so they are quantitative, and um, and there is ways to define formal semantics of either the model itself or parts of the model down to its individual elements using uh, semantic annotations and using formal ontologies. That's that's great. Uh, we have a similar situation in the clinical information model space. So our models are like patterns or blueprints for uh, some real clinical data to be captured. Um, and therefore, uh, they are designed for instantiation. So uh, our models are usually uh, instantiated by real systems that capture data uh, conforming to these models. We also have the means to define uh, the, the, the semantics uh, of either the models or individual uh, parts of it. Uh, by using a, a methodology called terminology bindings. Uh, we don't use the term ontology in, in clinical medicine because it's, it's a bit overloaded. Our uh, colleagues don't like it. Uh, it looks a bit freaky and kind of scary, very computer science you know, maybe. So terminology, clinical terminology is very you know, clinical and you know, kind of you know, good stuff. So, but they're essentially ontologies, <laughs> uh, most of them. So we have the same means to annotate semantically using formal ontologies. So I think uh, clinical information models are really um, uh, providing uh, our, our some basis for, uh, you know, so getting some reliable data from uh, otherwise dirty uh, EHR structures. Uh, so we can use this data to validate uh, biophysical models. Uh, so, 
Um, I, I'm talking about really large amounts of uh, like hundreds and millions of records uh, in this case. Uh, and uh, the data obtained from using these clinical information models, uh, these uh, kind of uh, structured uh, data, can be fed as uh, parameter values, so you can uh, customize your models, predictive tools, uh, decision support tools, etc. I think it's just uh, uh, one of the goals of the, the physio uh, uh, initiative or uh, vision. And, and to me, it's really um, you know, clinical data are really things of very valuable knowledge, so they embody the effects of uh, really the environment on our, uh, our biological uh, processes uh, and at, at, at all levels, and also some unexplained random phenomena. Uh, so all, all, all the manifestations of these things that you probably cannot model uh, is, is already expressed in the clinical data, you, so you might not want to use it as an explorative, uh, uh, you know, resource. Uh, some ex early explorations uh, the, within the physio and the uh, BPH context, uh, there has been uh, an, an initiative uh, uh, called the Digital Patient. Basically, this is like an integrated uh, view of all patient-specific models for creating more affordable and kind of uh, 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 predictive tools. Uh, so where clinical data gets into this is the, the personalization of the model. So you need really clinical data uh, linkages with the computational models. I think um, um, so. You know, um, the two modeling formalisms uh, will help achieve this goal. There has been a specific uh, uh, project work package which looked at creating some patient avatars, which is really related with the digital patient. But it's more kind of representational or visualization oriented. Uh, it's my take on it. And a patient avatar is nothing more than really uh, a, a clinical information model that models uh, the entirety of a, a person's health information. Uh, and uh, the Open EHR standard uh, has been chosen uh, just for experimenting uh, um, in this project. Now, I'm going to switch and take you to a journey into the world of uh, medical informatics. Uh, it's, it's a dirty one and it's unhappy, but I'm going to show you all the happy, uh, happy ones. So there has been years and years of uh, effort in, in, in the standardization of our uh, terminology, our processes, annotations and governance and modeling uh, patterns and etc. And for most part, these efforts have uh, vanished, and um, they have just vaporized. And what remains is what I'm going to show you. So I hope that uh, you know you guys can learn from uh, some of the things that uh, have happened. So basically, in the area of EHR interoperability, we, we talk about uh, basically four levels of uh, stacks of standards. One is uh, the data. I'm not going to talk about it. It's really generic. It's not that specific. The, the semantics starts with the terminology standard. It's really just a minimal amount of stuff that's required to define the, the semantics of uh, health information. Uh, but it is the clinical information models that fit into this bit that define the contents of uh, clinical information. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. And we also need uh, some process side of things so that we can exchange uh, uh, clinical information. There are specific standards for that as well. So with clinical terminology, I'm using it as an umbrella term to refer to uh, a number of things from a simple, simple uh, flat list of uh, quotes to very uh, advanced, like SNOMED, uh, some formal uh, ontological representations. Uh, so when I talk about clinical terminology, please include the definition of formal ontologies into it as well. These are some popular terminologies, uh, which some of you might have heard of. ICD is really very ubiquitous in, um, in coding in hospitals uh, by the World Health Organization. It's been here for more than a century now. Uh, the SNOMED CT is really the uber clinical terminology, the single most uh, you know, greatest ultra mega super ontology, uh, which you should all be aware and we should be looking at uh, using it. 
Floyd is for lab results. And, uh, um, so the big problem is we have hundreds of uh, these alternatives, and it's really difficult to decide which one to choose, but uh, I'm going to show you the pertinent one. So Snow CP covers all, all EHR. So it's not just about diagnoses, or it's not just about um, lab results or um, you know um, anatomical uh, locations. It covers everything, and it's, uh, it has more than 300,000 concepts. Um, it's it's a lot, believe me. And um, so these are just the concepts. Then there are about 800,000 um, terms associated with these concepts. So there may be synonyms, and uh, you know there may be more than one term uh, associated with the concept. And what is more important and I think really valuable is there is almost uh, a million and a half relationships uh, defined between these concepts and uh, it's hierarchically uh, organized into multiple axes so you can uh, browse it or you can search it. It's uh, governed by a very powerful uh, standards uh, organization um, and they usually uh, license countries and I think the US is paying like 30 million US dollars per annum for a country license, and in New Zealand we are paying, I think, around uh, 70,000 uh, New Zealand dollars. Uh, obviously, they have better bargaining power power than the US. <laughs> um, it is the most pertinent terminology, uh, and um, through a system which I will explain in the very end, uh, also to hundreds of others, including some of the biological uh, ontologies, and it has an all representation. So this stuff is important. It is so big that you need tools. There are free browsers, analytical tools, uh, graphing visualization tools, encoder tools. But basically, the idea is I picked up a, a, a concept, which is coronary artery sclerosis. It's a disease. And here it shows me the list of synonyms associated with it, each having its own uh, uh, identifier. There are some subtypes, like different types of coronary artery sclerosis. And there are some relationships defined for this, saying that uh, you know it has a morphological abnormality uh, of arterial sclerosis, and also anatomically this is bound to your coronary artery structure, so you don't expect to see this in your big toe, computationally speaking. There is another view from a tool. So when you select the concept, uh, and you can create all the uh, related concepts and the relationships going all the way to the root of the uh, component. Uh, so this is, I think, very important for the discussion of composite uh, kind of annotations and creating some um, meaning, more uh, uh, adding more meaning to atomic concepts. So in SNOMED, um there are two ways to do it. One is called pre-coordination. Um, this is really not ontologically uh, sound, but it is pragmatic. So it's like gastric ulcer. There are two different concepts, gastric and ulcer. Uh, Post-coordination is the formal way to do it, uh, using description logic. So you can actually add more meaning by specifying relationships, and then more terms, and then relationships, and more terms. Uh, so this is all within the from CT uh, itself. I think this is very similar to your uh, composites. What is very interesting, and I think thought provoking is uh, this is one of the, uh, I'm getting to the last, uh, uh, to the end. Uh, I think the most notable um, aspect of dealing with clinical information models and the semantics is the, the notion of a clinical uh, terminology query. Uh, there is a new uh, draft specification to define, formally define how you refine, how you define a subset of terms from an ontology or a terminological resource in a very precise manner so that you don't put all these things into your model, but you write this query in your model so that you can define a, a service, an API, which would provide in the runtime these values uh, if needed or a subset of them. Uh, and that's, that's interesting. So for example, uh, there's an example. Um, they have already created an, a subset called an allergic event. So they can directly refer to this 
set, it's a composite, it's, it has lots of memory. But what they are doing here is they're actually using some set union operations, and these uh, length brackets are uh, indicating their uh, subtypes. So they are getting uh, allergy events with a causative agent uh, having uh, all subtypes of pharmaceutical and biological products or uh, uh, substances. Uh, so you can find this in the run from a model which has an element which may run to define uh, things with uh, it. And also, uh, object management group, which sets a standard for the, for the web, that's how they call themselves, and HR7, which is a healthcare uh, standard organization. They are working on a, a second revision of the specification, which defines the, the API to serve these uh, ontological queries. I think this is a model you can borrow from uh, uh, the medical informatics domain. One thing to learn uh, talking about is the Unified Medical Language System. It's a resource from the National Library of Medicine. It's freely available. What this is doing is it's linking uh, all most um, pertinent clinical terminology and ontologies with other stuff that you guys are working with. So you can actually get mappings between these uh, things at the ontological level. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that. How much time do I have? Zero. I'm wrapping up. Uh, just a few slides. Um, so OpenEHR is the mainstay uh, clinical information modeling uh, uh, standard. It very much works like an Apache Foundation. It's a free group working with a couple of individuals. We are not the formal standard for it. Um, it's extensively used in, uh, in, in research. And, um, and I, I lead one of the programs. And I've been elected to the board of the, uh, of the foundation very recently. So we have open source tools to, uh, to create and to, uh, to modify and annotate our models. And uh, so what happens is uh, we can link either the model as a whole with the uh, ontological uh, for defining its clinical meaning or biological meaning. But we can also do very interesting things like we can link uh, the values of uh, the value set of an item to a terminology using a query, which is something uh, uh, you know to think about. And uh, I will talk about the rest tomorrow. Uh, one last thing worth mentioning is uh, this is an alternative standard. Uh, actually, it's a complementary thing. Uh, coming from health level 7, it's mainly US centric and it's called uh, FIRE. Uh, it's all modern web technologies based RDA, RESTful APIs, you know, it's ticking all the boxes, and they also uh, define what they call resources, they are uh, clinical information models, and we are working with them uh, to, uh, to align the content. So I think uh, in order to link the two universes, I think we should really focus. So I think the, the both modeling roles uh, have the means for and the tooling to put the semantic annotations. I think the key considerations should be to focus on some shared uh, semantics by looking at shared ontologies and identifiers. For example, SNOMED has its own anatomical uh, description, but it's not compatible with FMA. And there's a study which compared uh, these two things found that they are quite similar because they ultimately refer to the same uh, fact. Um, and I think more research is really uh, needed from uh, a shared annotation approach. And I think the place that we, will, we may find ourselves to, uh, at is we may be looking at some shared governance and shared uh, clinical and you know computational modeling uh, you know patterns maybe, uh, but it's too early to, to talk about. And thank you. Standard way of uh, doing that, doing that. 
Yes, uh, the severity was related with the diagnosis, so uh, diagnosis of the disease. So, synonymous CT uh, has an enumerated value for the effects like low, medium, you know, high, so uh, enumeration. So um, this is about some um, new work and some new ideas that we've been thinking about in Melbourne over the last 12, 18 months or so. Um, and it's really come out of, um, I think, three different things, what, three different motivations. One is um, some questions that I started asking um, probably more than 10 years ago um, when I first started um, thinking about modeling um, processes going on in, in heart cells. Um, and I know it was that uh, long ago because I'm going to use a couple of slides that I used in the talk. It's the first seminar I gave at the ABI. So um, I won't tell you which slides I'm going to reuse from that talk, but um, that's the sort of time scale. But the second motivation is really um, uh, follows on from what John um, Gennari mentioned earlier today, which is about uh, model reuse and reuse of other people's models. Um, actually, what we found um, in, in the group is that we sometimes struggle to reuse our own models. Um, we build models of um, cellular processes and then try to build them into models of cell, cell physiology and cell function. Sometimes we find that when we assemble those model pieces, the whole system doesn't work, and we, we, we struggle to understand why sometimes. Um, and then the third thing that happened was that um, this guy, uh, the guy with the hat, um, Peter Gorfrock, um, arrived in Melbourne and sort of knocked on my office door and said, hi, I'm the control engineer, and I want to tell you about bond graphs. And um, so he did, he told me a lot about bond graphs, and we, we've been working on this ever since. So the, the other person up here is Joe Curzons, who uh, a number of you will know, um, who's now a postdoc with me in Melbourne, and has also been working with us on this, um, on this project. Um, so I'm going to spend um, some time on motivation, actually, before I get to talking about um, what we're actually doing at the moment. And so that first motivation is um, reuse of models, so the idea that we have existing models of, of cells and cell physiology, and we might want to be able to um, take those models and decompose them into components, which describe, for example, currents through um, ion channels, um, fluxes of, um, of species across the membrane carried by transporters, pumps, and, and the like. Um, and from those model components, we um, may want to be able to reassemble uh, new composite models which describe different cells and different cell physiology. So this is... Um, something that's been spoken about a lot. And one of the things that's um, bothered me about this, and I think this is a really important thing to do, but one of the things that's bothered me about this is the simple question of, 
how do we know that when we assemble these components into a new model, that model is going to make any sense? Now, what do I mean by make sense? I don't mean make biological sense, because after all, that's really the intent, well, that's one of the intentions of building a model in the first place, is to test whether it makes biological sense. What I mean is, does it make physical sense? So does this new model that you've constructed make physical sense? Um, does it um, make physical sense in terms of con con conservation of mass, conservation of charge, basic thermodynamical principles? Um, so uh, are you actually constructing a model uh, which obeys the laws of physics? So why might you care about that? Well, here is um, the kind of thing that can go wrong. So this is um, a very old model, the Lua-Rudy model of the action potential and the calcium transient in a, in a cardiomyocyte, um, a guinea pig cardiomyocyte, an old model from 1994. So yes, this is one of those old slides. Um, and it works very nicely. It gives a very faithful reproduction of the action potential here in blue and the um, calcium transient in green. But it has some decidedly un, uh, undesirable properties. So one of those is that if you change the initial concentration of potassium in the model, then you get a different testing potential for, um, uh, for the membrane. So in dynamical systems terms, you're taking a different initial condition for your problem, and then you find the steady state, and you find the steady state has changed just as you start with a different initial condition. So if you know about dynamical systems, first of all, you know that that means that something's a little bit awry in the way that you've formulated your model. And if you, if you, if you know a lot about dynamical systems, you know exactly what's happening. I'll get to that in a moment. The second thing is, if you look at this red curve, so I'm plotting time now on the x-axis and the concentration, the intracellular concentration of potassium on the y-axis. This red curve is what happens if you simulate not just for one action potential or a couple of action potentials, but now you simulate over, over 20 minutes, so rather than a couple hundred milliseconds. Simulate this model again and again and again. And what happens is that the concentrations just wander off. So they don't stay at once. They wander off. Something's wrong about that. I mean, that doesn't happen in, in, a, in a cardiomyocyte. So this is just a zoom in uh, to see what's happening. And if you plot uh, potassium on the x-axis against voltage on the uh, membrane voltage on the y-axis, you're not in a closed loop in the phase plane. not going around and around and around every constantly. So what's going on? Well, I'm going to show a couple of different equations. And I would have apologized, except people have been showing code. So I guess if people are showing code, showing equations is OK. Um, but what's going on is the following. If we, if we look at the toilet model, which is up the sodium influx, the sodium channel of potassium efflux, um, and the sodium uh, potassium exchanger, just shown here schematically, then the differential equations that describe this model are the, the very standard ones for electrophysiology. Um, you have the um, equation of membrane potential, which is really just describing the capacitance of the cell membrane. And you have um, terms for the, of my pointer, you have terms for the, the, the sodium current, the potassium current, and the current that's carrying the um, um, sodium pump, because that's an electrogenic transporter. And then if you look at the equation, that describes the rate of change of membrane potential, but then the equation for the change of concentration of sodium, then the sodium inside the cell concentration changes because the sodium comes into the cell and the sodium current, and um, because sodium is pumped out of the um, cell on the sodium uh, potassium pump, um, the plus sign here is just definition which is which is inward and which is outward. Um, and again, you have an equation for the interest of potassium concentration. Again, you have potassium current, and then you have the um, potassium that's carried by the sodium pump and the, uh, the two there is to get the circulatory. Two potassiums are removed uh, from the cell, sorry, into the cell, which are three sodiums at the end of the cell. Now, the observation about these equations, which in fact you can make very easily by hand, is that when you add them together, all these right hand sides cancel out. Well, if you add them together with an appropriate scaling quantity, the right hand sides cancel out. So I've got a rate of change of three different things equals zero. So what that means is that a conservation law. It means that the total amount of sodium plus the total amount of potassium plus this set of constants times the membrane potential is a constant. And I didn't know that when I formulated the model, but that actually leads to all this strange behavior that we've, that we've just seen. So actually, what it means is I don't need to solve three ordinary differential equations at all. I need to solve two ordinary differential equations and one algebraic equation. And that, if you implement it in those terms, then the problem with the um, initial condition uh, dependence goes away. Um, and so, um, because that's how you deal with the fact you've got conservation law. So this is actually, once you know that this can happen in these equations, and people have now realized this, once you know this happens in these equations, the problem can go, go away quite easily. But in um, more complex models, and in lots of systems biology models, there are all kinds of conservation relationships like this, conserved moieties, 
um, charge conservation, which is a better way of also saying is charge, charge conservation. All these kinds of conservation relationships can turn up without you expecting them. And so if you don't know how to find them automatically, it's actually very difficult to track them down. So that's, that's, that's one motivation. Um, I might skip over this as I'm talking very slowly, but this also accounts for why you get that drip. So if you have, um, if you stimulate your, your, your model with an applied current, um, then you would normally just write that as a, an extra current in your, in your differential equation with membrane potential. But actually, I've just told you, you've got a charge conservation. We've broken the charge conservation now. So what's actually happening is every time you stimulate the cell, you're putting some charge into the cell. And then the part of your model that describes sodium potassium then has to try and get that charge out. But that charge came from nowhere. That charge came from, from out of thin air. So if you then, so every time, every time you, you have a, a, a stimulus current, you're kicking your membrane potential without changing any of the concentrations of these charged species. If you add, that this current is actually carried by potassium, and add it to the potassium equation, and you recover your conservation relationship, and now you go around and around and around the base plane, and you have charge conservation. So th this kind of thing is, is now generally um, included in these models. So the other thing is, um, this is really something from work that, um, oh, sorry. So here's now the applied current carried by potassium. Um, the other thing um, is uh, work that um, I was doing with Kenneth Tran um, some years back. So this is looking, for example, at um, circa, the, the calcium part. So circa, um, so calcium is put into the, the, the cell um, after the membrane depolarizes. Um, through cell type calcium. Um, calcium is then released in bulk through um, anti receptor activation, calcium released from the SR. And that calcium um, activates contraction but gets pumped back into the stores on, on the circuit. Um, most models, or a lot of models, still just have a simple phenomenological sort of hill type function for, for circuit activity, um, just relating to the, the, the flux to the concentration of calcium, possibly to the, to the ratio of calcium across this membrane. But, but the fact is that that process requires energy. You're pumping calcium against a, a concentration gradient, or no concentration to high concentration, and you're building up the concentration inside inside this store to higher and higher concentrations. And at some point, the energy that you have to put in to drive calcium against this concentration gradient is equal to the energy that's available from ATP hydrolysis, which is where the, the, the energy to drive this process comes from. <clears throat> and so in our models, um, well, if we want to have biophysically um, based models which represent the thermodynamics of what's happening in cells, we need to be able to account for the fact that the pump flux will stop when the energy that's available to pump is matched by the energy that is required to pump calcium against the, uh, the gradient. And so, again, there are very well uh, worked ways of doing this. You need to model this process as an enzymatic cycle and account for the free energy available from ATP hydrolysis. And so, Ken has wrote a very nice paper, goodness me, over five years ago. Um, uh, uh, describing this process in, in some detail, providing the first, I think, biophysically, sorry, the first thermodynamically um, valid model of the, of, the, of the circuit. So this provides the motivation. So the motivation, um, how do we construct models that make physical sense? And by physical sense, I know, I'm, at, I'm in conservation of mass, conservation of charge, uh, conservation of energy, and thermodynamic principles around how we model these kinds of enzyme cycles. Um, and uh, to take it further than that, how do we do this where we can incorporate um, uh, biochemical processes, electrophysiological processes, and, and mechanical processes into the same modeling framework? So to have a common framework which allows us to describe those different kinds of, um, of physics. Um, and then, as I, as I mentioned, to be able to build larger models from smaller ones, it's all very well to say, look, I've got a model of an enzyme, and that enzyme model is nice and thermodynamically consistent. But how do I make sure that um, when I combine it with another set of model uh, um, of components to build a sort of composite model, that, it, that when I join them together, mass is still conserved and energy is still conserved? And then finally, um, again, um, something which is which is which is very often discussed: modularity. How can I use concepts of modularity to to, to break apart to simplify um, uh, models that are building? So these kinds of motivations, I think, are really nicely addressed by some very um, old concepts, um, which were which are called, uh, it's called network thermodynamics. So this is a bunch of um, uh, ideas which were developed in uh, really um, uh, a lot of detail by Oscar Perlson and, and Kachowski back in the 70s. And so what they were thinking about is how do you represent um, so the, the, the thermodynamics how do you represent chemical reactions as well worked out. But they were thinking about how do I how does one represent the thermodynamic and kinetic properties when you have lots and lots of chemical reactions interacting with each other in some sort of a, a network, a biochemical network of interaction. 
And they proposed this idea of a bond graph um, as a way of keeping track of everything that's going on. Um, and so this is this is really well established work. And so the question is, well, why if this was all proposed in the 1970s, why why didn't it go anywhere? Why are we not already using this this, this approach to formulation? And I think the answer is that well, this is certainly before its time. Um, and what's happened away from um, the biochemical context? So I think at the time, there probably weren't the kinds of models that we now have to enable this, this stuff to be very useful. They also developed it in a very theoretical way. And I think it's now having had um, sort of the best part of 40 years where completely away from systems biology, completely away from biochemical modeling, bond graphs have been used extensively in other kinds of engineering um, and sort of, uh, modeling of physical systems. There are lots of very nice um, tools that we can use um, to actually use this formulation Really, really is a set of tools for, for model building rather than a sort of a theoretical. So, um, what is a bond graph then? Well, so I, um, I spoke to my colleague, Peter Gorthrock, professorial fellow, about how does one talk about bond graphs. He said, Edmund, the first rule about bond graphs is don't show them a bond graph. It's, it's a bit like um, you know, first rule of bond graphs, nobody talks about bond graphs. Second rule of bond graphs, nobody talks about bond graphs. So um, I'm going to ignore his advice and just give you a, 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 just, just a, a, hint of, a hint of what bond graphs are. Basically, the idea is to focus on processes, focus on biochemical processes, transformations. The idea is that you represent these processes as bonds, as power bonds, and they're um, illustrated with these sorts of harpoons. And for each of these harpoons, you specify two things, an effort and a flow. This is just all new, tech, uh, new terminology. What, what do efforts and flows mean? Well, effort and flow are two things that when you multiply them together, uh, they give you power. So, examples that um, may be very familiar are things like mechanical translation, so force times velocity is power. Um, in the electrical context, um, voltage times current gives you power, in terms of hydraulic pressure gives you power. So, the question is if one is to use this, this sort of formalism, what is the appropriate um, effort and what's the appropriate flow in the biochemical context? And so the proposal is that for biochemical processes, you describe um, effort as chemical potential. So this is like the, um, the sort of potential energy for a chemical reaction. And flow is modal flow. So it's the, the, the flow of species uh, through a reaction, through a process. So not, this doesn't necessarily mean physical flow. It means the, um, the, the modal flow um, in a reaction with the, with the, um, uh, the rate. And so if you look at the, the um, uh, the units of these things, then chemical potential mu has units of joules per mole, and molar flow has units of um, moles per second. And so that, does, that pairing doesn't give you um, power. So this sort of bond graph approach is based on the idea, the idea that all the chemical processes we might want to describe, we need to specify these two things, the chemical potential um, and uh, the, the, the molar flow. And this is going to be how we couple thermodynamics about chemical potentials and kinetics. So here is where, where I, where I um, show you a bond graph. So first of all, I'm going to show you a bond graph for a very, very simple process. For a process to be thermodynamically um, uh, describable, it has to be reversible. So really the simplest process you can describe is A uh, um, forms B and B forms A, a reversible process. So the bond graph looks like this. Basically, you just have a species A, and there is some process or reaction here and it forms species B. Um, the bonds are just giving you a, a sign convention. Every bond is reversible. That's the, the nature of bond graphs. Um, and you specify uh, the chemical potential for species A and the molar flow. And you specify the chemical potential for species B and the molar flow. Um, and so there's a set of, of rules about, um, about how these things are connected. Um, and one specifies, so in this case, chemical potentials so I'm not going to go into so much detail. So if you know what chemical potentials are, then this should make sense. If you don't, don't worry about it. But effectively, this is describing the, the chemical energy that, that you have in your sort of reservoir of species A. If you have a high concentration, you have a high chemical energy. If you have a low uh, concentration, you have a low chemical potential. Low potential sorry. Um, and then the molar flows, well, there, there's a bit more uh, choice here to how you describe the molar flows. And again, I'm not going to go into it. But um, the molar flow um, can be described in relation to the chemical potential. So I'm describing them as affinities here because um, uh, this, uh, um, this generalizes the situations where um, you take weighted uh, sums of the chemical potentials, for example, if you have uh, many species taking part in the reaction. 
But effectively, what this does is it gives you a relationship between the, the thermodynamics of a chemical reaction and the kinetics, the rate of that chemical reaction. And these things are these things are coupled, although there is a, a kinetics parameter. So the thermodynamics tells you whether something goes or not, and there is a kinetic parameter that tells you how fast it goes. So you still need to specify those things separately. So one of the things that the von Graaff formulation does is it gives you ways of connecting different processes together. So there are lots of um, lots of these things, and I'll only sort of briefly illustrate one of them. But junctions, junctions have particular properties where junctions don't store creative or dissipate energy. So this, this whole idea of being able to specify how you link things together without them being black holes for mass or energy or anything like that. So if I have um, A goes to B and B goes to C, if I can couple them together, then I can use something called a, a zero junction. Um, and which, uh, to layer what, what, what that is, but it's simply a way of coupling together um, two uh, little odd graphs, which one of which describes A goes to B and one of which describes A goes to C. And by coupling them, coupling them together, I know, because of the specification of the bond graph, that the overall thermodynamics of this process is also valid, that mass is also conserved in this process because it was in each of these two reactions that are coupled together, and because the bond graph formulation insists that. Well, it doesn't insist, it um, ensures that when you couple things together, that um, energy can't leave the system, that mass can't suddenly appear out of nowhere or disappear into it. So that gives us a way of, um, that gives us a very low level way of doing modularity. So we've been um, applying these ideas to much more uh, sort of complicated systems. So this is an example, um, it's a paper from um, Martin Kushmerich, Lambert and Kushmerich from, um, from 2002, and it's a model of the glycolytic pathway. So, Starting with um, glycogen and moving through glycolytic pathway, we end up with pyruvate and, and, and lactate um, at the end, and also specifying um, the ATP ADP um, reaction, so the um, uh, relationship between creatine kinase and adenylate kinase. And again, if you don't know what these things are, it doesn't matter. But this, so this is basically a, this is a, a, a metabolic pathway actually represented in um, in um, SBGN. Um, which I, I won't talk about, but I think it's, it's a very natural way of trying to represent bond graphs in a way which is a little bit less intimidating than the things I've just been showing. Um, so, so we can represent this um, in a bond graph where, where we're describing the kinetics and the thermodynamics of each of these uh, each of these reactions, each of which is under the control of an enzyme. Um, and so uh, Daniel Hurd is going to talk a little bit more about this um, tomorrow in terms of um, how we've gone about um, have some of this process. Um, but what's really nice about this is that what the bond graph um, gives you a very nice way of. Um, so, just go back. So, what this um, tells you is uh, processes by which um, uh, um, glycogen is being converted into lactate, um, processes by which ATP is being um, uh, recycled from ADP, and processes by which ATP is being used. Um, and ATP is the free energy that we use to drive reactions, um, and ATP is being produced. And so, the bond graph gives you a nice way of representing. There's ATP covering reactions, the ATP producing reactions, and the ATP consuming reactions. So we can have this sort of top level um, sort of hierarchy. And so this part here is the um, glycogen to lactate, so central part of that pathway. And so I can zoom in on that part. That's meant to be a box around that, which you can't see, but zoom in on that part. And I've got um, what seems very natural from the sort of cell and point of view. I've got some, um, some ports, I've got some sort of connectors which tell me um, how I can connect. This um, part of this, uh, this sort of larger um, uh, picture into different components. So here is now um, uh, the first part of that pathway, uh, glycogen converted into um, fructose, bisphosphate, and so on and so forth. And then I can, I can take uh, that and take uh, this piece of it and blow that up into um, a more detailed part of the pathway where now I've got each of these um, enzymes uh, described. So it, there's this very natural way of modularizing a system on the basis of, um, of processes um, on, on the basis of the function of um, each of these different parts of the reaction. And of course, um, so the point about this is to produce models you can do something with. And so again, it, um, uh, um, the, the, the approach um, allows you very easily to compute um, the different, in this case, just the ODEs describing the system and all of the fluxes for the different um, enzyme catalyzed reactions in the system. So I mean, it does what you hope it does. You hope it does. You can represent the system in this nice sort of modular hierarchy, and then you can just calculate the, um, the, the equations that you need to solve. 
So what we're currently doing is, is extending. So we've, we've looked at um, enzyme cycles. Um, we've looked at some, some of these simple uh, metabolic systems. And we're now extending this to electrochemical processes. And this is a very natural thing to do because um, the chemical potential that I told you has a very natural extension to an electrochemical potential. So when you're moving charged species across a, um, um, uh, across a membrane, where there's an electrical potential across the membrane, then you just effectively add an extra term to your chemical potential to turn into an electrochemical potential. Because there's energy required to move positive charge, for example, across um, uh, an electrical um, uh, potential. And so we've, we've actually just recently, we've finished um, completely recoding that's the wrong way to put it, reformulating Hodgkin Huxley's model as a bond graph. And it's very interesting all sorts of things that throws up. It's really one of the foundation models. Um, and it throws up some really interesting things about, about that model. Um, but it can be um, quite easily converted using this approach into, in, into a bond graph. What's really interesting about it is that effectively the bond graph approach describes everything in the same way. So now everything is described as if it was, well, everything is described as one of these processes, and everything is effectively described um, like a simple chemical reaction. So it means that you can apply lots and lots of the sorts of things which are kind of very um, easy to apply to metabolic systems, to the sort of stoichiometric analysis, um, metabolic control analysis, all those sorts of things are readily applied to um, models where you're describing electrochemical processes as well as biochemical processes. And we hope to extend to mechanical processes. We haven't done much work on this yet. Um, this is in part, in part um, sort of driven by uh, the observation that a, a very recent paper of ours where we describe um, uh, mechanics of cross-bridge cycling. Um, at the moment, um, it's very hard to see how you connect mechanical work to the biochemistry of cross-bridge cycling. So we're hoping that um, we'll be able to uh, again, we'll be able to do that by effectively turning turning the mechanical um, part of that model into the, set the, basically into the same formulation. So, so why, why do I think this is a this is a particularly useful approach? Well, really, because it it does that first piece of first piece, but it, it does a piece of this. Um, Process that, um, that, that I think maybe hasn't been um, quite so well addressed, which is that when we assemble models into, into these composite models, how do we think about the, the, the physical sense of, of, the, of the new model that we create? So the von Rapp approach imposes a formalism, which means that you actually can't get it wrong. You, know, you can make a model that makes physical sense, it may, may be an utter nonsense as far as biology is concerned, but you can't actually propose a model that makes no sense. Um, and as I've shown, I think that's an important thing. So it imposes a uh, thermodynamic formalism. Um, there are lots of things that it will automatically determine for you. So I haven't said it. It, it automatically determines all these conserved um, properties. There are easy ways of parsing these bond graphs, which will tell you actually these species, when you have them together, give you one of these conservation rules. Um, modularity sort of comes built into this, which is very nice. Um, this coupling, as I mentioned, this coupling uh, ensures that if you've got little sub-models, each of which is a, a valid bond graph and put together, you've got a valid bond graph. So it still makes physical sense. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been developed, tools, markup language. There's something called um, BGML, there's a, there's a markup language for bond graphs. So there's a whole bunch of tools that come with this, which have been developed by communities using bond graphs to model large-scale electrical systems, large-scale mechanical systems, large-scale electromechanical systems, and so on and so forth. Which we can, which we can borrow. From. There's very nice techniques for model simplification on the basis of time scales. Um, so you can do formal model reduction again, just on the basis of the model specification uh, in this way. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Two things. Two things. Um, that presumably it handles the right? have you looked at models where the change change? So that's a very good question. Only, oh well, only if it's implicitly included in the potential. So, I, I, so the short answer is I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I can't think on my feet as to whether the chemical potential implicitly includes the Components, or whether you need to add, you doesn't does it? Like, so you need to add more components. So I think that yeah, you just have to add an extra term to your, your potential. The second one is: is there a um, linear? Is there any sort of linearity in the relationship between blood flow driven by potential gravity? What about if you want to predict all the inertia into the spring of some mechanical? Um. 
game, I thought it was going to be a hard mode. So the end of said is that so what we've been discovering, which is very exciting, is the kinds of connections that talking to John and Brian. Um, on graphs, it turns out, are really the conceptual basis behind the ontology of physics and biology. It's what Dan Cook and others have been, been developing. Yeah, so the bond graphs is the underlying concept. And very good answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to say the answer is definitely yes, but I'm actually not sure what I can say that, so I'll say. Yeah, you talked about energy, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan is talking about um, things that I mean, energy is one of them, but I don't know if we really. Oh, he also said, yes. Yeah. You usually don't use the word power, but he talks yeah. about the, the difference uh, between the sources and things. Yeah, that's what's driving. Yeah. And that's the, 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 the New York Times of general conception. But it could also be. But it could be any other, any other kind of energy. <laughs> Is there, is there an implicit uh, um, scale with the number of Oh dear, third time, so I don't know. Certainly, I think I looked at the um, yeah, continuous concentration. Because again, I don't know if the is in the limit of. You know, low, low, low down spot. So, well, basically, the answer is not right. So, actually, probably the answer is no, but it's a feminine principle is is invalid. I mean, it's it's continuum feminine. Today is from Mike, who's going to talk about parallel model physics. And if you see a bus show up and start to leave, chase it. <laughs> so, how, how long have I fished it from? Well, there is going to come a bus. Oh, okay. Okay, we're going to have a little bit of time to tell you Okay, so. <laughs> so, uh, now for something completely different. So, this is kind of like a, a little tool talk, really. Um, just something that has been on the back burner for a long time. It's, it's just recently got to the point where it's actually useful. Um, and this is this slide really starts to describe the motivation for this thing I'm going to talk about. And it'll be familiar to many of you as, as models, but I'm aware we've got some modern models here. So um, if I've got a mathematical model of, of something happening, some very simple equation, uh, sorry, some very simple system, two things back here to make C. Um, I might have a very simple equation here for that um, to describe that process. And already I've got um, four things that I can think of as parameters, so four things I need to find numbers for uh, in order for the behavior of this system to match reality. So I've got a, I've got a rate constant, and I also need to know the initial conditions of A, B, and C. So I hardly need to do anything at all before I've got lots of parameters. And if I've got even a, a really big small model of something, um, that I modeled a long time ago. Um, we've got perhaps 15 species and 50 rate constants. So we've got a lot of um, unknowns. And that's a bit of a problem. Um, so the way I've generally gone about trying to reduce that, if there's no other information available, is to look at uh, how these systems actually behave in the wild. So in a real self, with some inputs, what are the outputs? And that normally comes to me in the form of some experimental observations. Probably can't read that, but that's what that says there. So these red um, blobs are, and somebody's gone to the trouble of making some um, observations in the wet lab. And generally, what we do is this is, is twiddle the parameters and tell our simulations match in some sense the um, experimental observations. And so that's an example of just one set of observations. And you can imagine that if we do this a lot for lots of different observations, um, then we can start to build up a bit more confidence in, in a model, even if we've got lots of unknowns. So essentially, all the time, I have this fitting problem where I've got a complicated system, and I want to fit it to lots and lots of data. 
because really I otherwise I don't know what the parameters should be. And if I find good six, it's usually six of parameters. Um, if I haven't got quite enough data, then um, I'm looking for good sets that will cause the system to behave like the, the real experiments did. So uh, I need some sort of algorithm to do this fitting for me. I don't want to do it by hand. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. Um, so a good optimal algorithm doesn't exist. And this um, upsets some of my school of colleagues in um, engineering science when I say this, but it really doesn't. Um, unless you know very specific things about very specific kinds of problems. So what I tend to do is use something called a genetic algorithm, which is a, an optimizing, well, it's not an optimizing, it's a, it's a heuristic that doesn't quite guarantee to give me an optimal uh, solution, but it does at least um, explore the space of possible solutions in some way. So um, you may or may not have come across the, the, the GA, as we call them, uh, but basically what we're trying to do is exploit some uh, of the concepts around evolution. So uh, we have perhaps a, a range of uh, you can think of them as frogs, I do, in my head. Um, but really what they are is a random sets. And we essentially allow these things to, to breed, and we allow these things to, to mutate from time to time, um, which may give us perhaps better features, or possibly not so uh, good features. And really what that relates to is actually flipping these numbers into ways and, uh, and seeing what we get. And then the, the evolution bit is about applying selective pressure to these things, and that comes in the form of uh, the wet lab results that we're trying to constrain the model to. So what happens to this frog, for example, is a frog, which is really a set of parameters. These parameters get loaded into the model. The model simulates all the behaviors that we've got data for, and then that output of that is compared with the, the real um, data. And uh, some sort of fitness value is assigned to that particular frog. Um, and so some of these guys will do better than others um, for um, the measure that we have of how well does it fit the experimental data. And the ones that do well, um, we let them breed more, um, so essentially copy themselves into a new generation more than the ones that don't do so well. So in that, in that way, we apply a selective pressure. So what this really means from a computational point of view is that there's a lot of simulating going on. Um, we've got n experiments, and we hope that n is quite large. As large as we, um, we've got, as many as we can find, really, would be, would be good. Um, we might have a lot of these frogs. We might have, say, 450 of them in one generation. So 450 different parameter sets that we're trying to fit, use to fit uh, a model or models to a uh, set of experiments. And then, um, in order to get the whole breeding thing going, uh, we have to have a number of different generations um, to do that over. And so, for a simple process, and not anyone has a simple process or anymore, except maybe in your phone, um, then you know, we've got, we, we can run our computers for as long as we want, basically. Um, it's very easy, um, but it does accidentally to write problems which will take billions of years to solve. Um, this is also not so great. So, um, we need some way to do lots of simulations. And at the time, which was a few years ago now, um, the, the easiest way to do that was to use something called Nessie, which is, um, as you see, or maybe, I'm not sure if you can see, East Science Research Infrastructure in New Zealand. And they have a whole lot of interesting uh, services and um, things to use. But what really interested me was, was access to cores. So, Depending on the various environments, but depending on which one um, I can convince someone to let me into, I can have access to perhaps 8,000 cores on a good day. Um, so that's great, right? And it's, it's very useful because this system that, we've, um, that I've been um, talking about is inherently parallelizable. So if you think about it, each of these parameter sets could be. Um, could be run through the models and the models simulated and, and uh, compared to the um, wet lab experiments individually, right? So they don't depend on one another, they're all independent. And even within that, each experiment could be done, uh, each virtual experiment could be done independently. 
Uh, usually, sometimes it's not the case, but mostly it is. And so we could get rid of a lot of these. Uh, here's a simple problem, just to test things. Uh, there's a well-known, if you're into testing, this kind of thing, this function called Schwefel. Or Schwefel, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but this is just a simple problem with two independent variables and lots of, this is a, a fitness measure up here, and lots of um, local minima and maxima get stuck in. Um, and this is just showing that the thing basically works. I mean, this, there's lots of analysis to be done to, to convince oneself that it's working properly, which I won't bore you with. But um, here's a, a simple example um, that shows you two things. One, it's basically working, and secondly, uh, as I said, it's not guaranteed to give you an optimal solution. But for modeling purposes, you know, this sort of uh, fidelity would be close enough. That kind of accuracy would be fine. And so uh, the next step was to apply it to a biological problem, and I had one from a long time ago where I actually had to fit this piece by hand um, back then, and the uh, question I had was, I've always wondered whether I really found the best fit or not, I'd be very surprised. Um, so we put that through the, the system, and this is a bit of a summary graph. Um, so the generations are going on the bottom. And this thing at the top is the measure, is the median fitness um, for everybody in that generation, so all those frogs. So the initial population does quite badly, and it's, it's kind of an arbitrary measure, so the unit doesn't make a lot of sense, so I have even put them in. Um, but, but higher is worse, so um, the initial population does quite badly, and then we apply some selective pressure, and the really terrible ones get weeded out in fairly short order. And this looks probably flat to you, but it is actually dropping down slowly. And um, depending on the, the sort of topology of the space, this could dip down further or, or not. Um, so basically, any of these solutions in here would be would be fine uh, to use for the other kind of modeling. So, excuse me. Uh, yeah, but you said that's a medium, so it's not even a particular solution. No, that's right. So within there, there are there are even um, even better ones, and there are worse ones. And in fact, sometimes the best one overall might be somewhere in the middle. And then, um, because of the mm, stochasticity, I suppose, of, of breathing, you might actually accidentally print that one out. So, but it doesn't matter because it's all on computer, so we capture everything. Um, you're not guaranteed to get a unique solution either, but that also can be good because there may be many different ways that this could fit together. And the fact that there are tells me that there's. Um, other things that could be constrained, or it could lead to other kinds of insights about the problem. 
So that's basically working. Um, where a sort of obvious place to take this would be, um, which links back to what a few people have talked about today, is so first we know stretching, um, is we have models and we've got data coming in all the time. So this might be a model someone's made five years ago and then somebody else does some um, wet lab experimentation and some new data. How does the model um, form under some new conditions? Does it still produce? And probably the answer to that is no. Um, and you'd want to refine your model parameters to make sure that it did. So this sort of iteration between fitting some parameters, um, having your model and then bringing in more data, that's something I'd be quite interested in, uh, in having running in order to keep models current, if you like. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect is the idea of how do we actually represent these experiments uh, in the computer. So at the time, so I, I, I've got, uh, I'm trying to fit right to wet lab experiments. So I need some way to represent the protocol that was in the um, experiment uh, in something that the computer can then apply to the model on the fly. So uh, back a few years ago when I started doing this, uh, cinema wasn't quite, was just kind of emerging and not really up to that, uh, didn't do what I needed it to do. So in the end, I, I you know, basically brewed my own kind of format, but that's not a very, um, you know, that's not a very good thing to do in the long run. It, it also means I miss out on a lot of other advances that people sh can make in, in things like CML. And also, I think um, possibly a connection to the functional creation stuff of, of um, like Gary, who's probably going to talk about it tomorrow, um, would make a lot of sense in some way too, because we have some similar. Similar needs of that are coming at it to slightly different angles. So um, a sort of future direction, I guess, for this thing, which isn't isn't quite research, it's more of an implementation um, exercise, is to hopefully incorporate some ideas from or just set them out, right? To actually use set them out would be the best thing, probably. So uh, hopefully that made some kind of sense. Uh, I'd like to thank the people that funded this, although they may not have been aware of it at the time. Um, but they did, so thank you. <laughs> this is not just sort of one way to do GA. No. There's quite a few decisions. Yeah, there are. Yep. You can just play around with think of how many how many you keep in the in the in the pool. Yeah, but did you explore those? I think the very simplest thing that would work, because really the, the challenge with this was not the, I mean, it's quite easy to see how the pieces could fit together. The challenge was, was getting the CellML API up and running on a cluster, um, honestly. So, um, yeah, there's a lot you could do, and there's a, a lot of, um, the, the algorithm I've used is, is basically something from the, the 80s, I think. Um, and there's a lot of new stuff that actually Herb Sauro mentioned when he was at this meeting last year, which I've taken a look at and, and look even better, um, or, or more applicable to what I'm trying to do. Which, but in terms of changing that, I'm not sure where on this graph that would be. I guess it's on code that's sitting over here now. Um, it, it would just be a matter of, of putting in you know, another algorithm and having some way to switch between them, which we could put in my homebrew XML file somewhere. And in terms of, I mean, there's tuning parameters for the algorithm itself too, and for that it's it's really a case of um, trying things out and seeing, that's more of an art than a science too, which is um, also disturbs some people. <laughs> but not, not for a bad reason, I mean, it is disturbing. Um, was there a question somewhere over there? Oh yeah, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So a couple of related questions. The, um, uh, the first is, uh, was there a, a strong reason to go to uh, genetic algorithm approaches rather than, say, or try to improve uh, sort of number of optimization of Yeah, so I wasn't sure what, in the end, what kind of problems I might want to apply it to. So I wanted something fairly general. Um, I also spent some time, I haven't talked about it in here, but um, 
trying a number of different algorithms, different kinds of things that have been used um, for cellular biological kinds of problems. Um, so I put a summer student on it basically, and she went through and tried a whole lot of different methods. And we had some measure of how well they did under different circumstances. And in that um, study, the DA ended up being the most consistently useful. Um, but in certain situations, there will be other algorithms which will be better, uh, potentially. So, I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> I just want to understand the need for parallel solution API. So, what is the size of your state vector? Uh, well, it depends on the problem. So, what is it running to like? So, this is a database or server now API in parallel. The deep one is a simple model. Yeah. So. I can understand if your state vector is running to few terabytes. You might want parallelize or distribute over a large cluster. It's but if it's going to be, say, even a few megabytes, then I guess each MPI process is a independent process that you can just link the thermal library. So what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saving with the parallelization is time, computational time. So the, the state vector is small, it might be 15 doubles, um, but I, I need to do that 450 times 100 by n times. Right, so the data I'm working with is not large, but the, pro the processing cost is high. Um, and there is, the algorithm is such that it's inherently, uh, um, inherently independent Oh, these guys. So, so why not do them at the same time? So I get the point. So what yeah. I'm saying is, why do you need parallel thermal API? Because each MBA process is independent. It runs by itself. You can still run those. It's not, it's not API. Yeah. It's nothing really API. It's just got multiple implications. Yeah. So there's no API itself. It's not. They're all separate processes. Yeah. So why do you need parallel thermal API? I didn't. Oh, so, all right. <laughs> I think he's saying that the. Yeah. You got confused by the time. Yeah. This is what they call dumb parallelization. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just the same thing running on hundreds of. Yeah, I get that, but I just. Oh, sorry. So I just lost something else. Yeah. You got confused. It's parallelized. Cell ML API process, not parallel CMX cell ML API process. Just who knows the other thing past that. Yeah, I guess I didn't want to cut someone else's slide, but maybe I should have. <laughs> maybe I should have shown him a bit of part of the slide. It just felt like, you know, chopping up a bit of Yeah, anyway. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, in, 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 I did one. Attempts to 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 uh, uh, adjust the model to a set of uh, experimental data, and it's very often that I discover that parameters in there, in my model, uh, or in the equations, are nonsense. That is, they are useless or they don't move at all. Right. And in, in matrix form of a uh, for example, a, a uh, Markov process, you can easily detect that artists that states, for example. We see no filling and their empty velocities are very large, persisting coming to the So then it's a very easy way to eliminate this because mm. I can find never receives anything and loses everything. So uh, it's empty. So um, uh, the state is empty. So this led to a very, very simple um, uh, algorithm for simplification of the model. And in certain situations, there were perhaps. Uh, Half the state is useless. So right. I simplified very much the adjustment. So I think, and it comes to a second uh, view, um, some uh, inherent links between the parameters could be detected by just analyzing the uh, scheme. Uh, some uh, parameters are equivalent or variables. And this could be uh, readily. Uh, 
eliminated because they would cause such a loss of computing time just trying to find an optimum for these mm. with very large step for each and always wandering, wandering and never optimizing. So it's a good reason for eliminating the uh, yep. and synonyms. Yes. So you can reduce your time by making sure you've got a good model to start with. Yeah. Um, if you realistically if you analyze the output of the of the ongoing uh, running uh, optimization, mm -hmm. then you can detect those and yes. eliminate them. Yes. See whether the solutions are equivalent. Yep. So I, I haven't talked about that at all here. Um, so in addition to what you just said, um, which are two very good points, you can also I've also had situations where I thought I had optimized the model and hadn't quite. Um, and the results of the GA pick that up because what I get is a lot of solutions with very, if I go back to the, this kind of thing, imagine all these solutions are exactly the same except one number, say K2, is varying a lot. And the fitness value is exactly the same. And that tells me that this is doing nothing. Um, so it is possible to detect it after the fact sometimes too. Yep. Good fun. I think. I didn't catch what you said that the parameters, set of parameters you got out of was the same as what you had previously. Ah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so no, I haven't, I haven't found one yet that beats what I did before. Um, but I. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Um, it's, it's, it's not it's not that you know what it is it's type feedback so if you um because when i first have i got time for this little story yeah um i've got a captive audience um, so, so so when i first tried to fit that i thought that's impossible because it's so many degrees of freedom but then i thought about playing a musical instrument Right, so um, there's so many degrees of freedom, especially in a woodwind sort of instrument. I thought if you keep the feedback loop really tight, you can kind of use your subconscious to do it a bit. So that's what I tried to do. And I think I think that is, we can do a lot more by hand than we think. Um, but I, I also think the space is such that, um, you know, it's, it's, there'll be a better solution in there, I just haven't found it yet.